Hi everyone, this is Arkady Freckman, a New York City personal injury trial attorney. And today we're looking at jury verdicts, recent verdicts, in fact, the 10 most recent verdicts in the New York jury verdicts and settlements folder in one of the um, searches that we can do through either like Lexis, Westlaw, or the jury verdict reporter. So let's look at some of these and see what they're all about. So here's the first case that comes up. It's a case that went to trial in um, June of 2022. So it's not that recent, it's almost coming up on a year, but for some reason it's listed as one of the most recent cases. And it involved a simple car accident where somebody claimed that their vehicle was struck from the rear while stopped at a red light by a vehicle operated and owned by the defendant. And the injury was an L4, S1 disc herniation. So that's actually two levels, L4, L5, and then L5, S1. Two different levels of a disc herniation with spinal nerve encroachment and um, a C5, C6 bulging disc with cervical radiculopathy, meaning the bulging disc will, the pain will travel down to the arms. And then the left shoulder labrum and rotator cuff damage, which required surgery and left the plaintiff with a permanent painful limited motion. And so according to the plaintiff, the defendant failed to stop for the red light and basically rear-ended her. The defendant denied liability and filed a motion for summary judgment claiming the plaintiff failed to prove she had a serious injury. Now remember, in New York, you have to show that serious injury. It's a threshold. You have to overcome that threshold. So I guess the defendant's arguing, or rather their insurance company and the defense lawyer is arguing that the plaintiff did not meet that threshold. So then um, the defendant also noted the crash itself was a minor impact, no airbags, only a scratched bumper, and the plaintiff being involved in a more significant collision the very next day, which left her driver's side door bent and inoperable. So she was in another crash the very next day. That's not good for the plaintiff. So let's see what happened in this case. And by the way, this case was uh, being handled in Brooklyn, in Kings County. And let me see here. So the experts, they had a radiologist testify. I recognize the, the lawyer for the, I mean, I think I've seen the, the name of the firm, the lawyer for the plaintiff, the lawyer, oh yeah, the lawyer for the defendant as well. I recognize them and I recognize the judge. Um, so the, actually the result was a defense verdict. They got zero in this case. So that was, yeah. I guess maybe because of that crash the very next day where it was much more serious, that's that's hard to prove that everything is from this crash. If you have another crash the very next day, that's kind of a really bad fact. Okay, let's go to the next case. This was a case where the trial happened at the end of January of 2023. And let's see what happened here. <clears throat> this was a case where a lady was, um, she suffered serious injuries in a slip and fall down a staircase at a subway station. So she sued what's known as the New York City Transit Authority um, and the Metropolitan Transit Authority. They run the subway system. So she basically claimed um, disc herniations with four major back surgeries, including a laminectomy. <clears throat> she had two lumbar fusions and she had a cervical discectomy. So she had really serious injuries from this fall and um, she had a life-threatening infection, which left her with uh, permanent debilitating complex pain and a post-laminectomy syndrome. So I don't know if she means like complex regional pain or some other kind of, it doesn't really say, it's kind of very uh, broad, but it does say post-laminectomy syndrome. And she basically argued that the New York City Transit Authority failed to maintain the subway, including the stairs, and it allowed um, a dangerous condition, almost like a foot trap, to exist on that stairway. And then the defendants denied liability and argued there was snow and ice on the staircase, which was open and obvious because um, they said they had a maintenance crew that went out there. They did their best to clean the snow, but there was like a 14 inches of snow so and it was below freezing temperatures. And they also argued that the plaintiff had prior lumbar injuries. So before this, she already had lower back injuries. And that uh, surgery was performed three years after the incident. So they were trying to say that it's not because of this incident, because the surgery is three years later. And then they said her neck injury four years after the incident. 
and then after a brief period, she returned to work. So, um, the, so basically, this is what happened with the verdict. The, the jury found that the defendants were negligent. They found the plaintiff was not comparatively at fault at all. So they put all liability on the defendants. And then the um, compensatory award was $8 million. It was a really large award. It was $4 million compensatory pain and suffering, $550,000 for past wages, $3,450,000 for future wages. So the wages were, almost, were like $4 million and the pain and suffering was $4 million. So a total of $8 million. So that's a great verdict for the plaintiff. That was, yeah, that was in January. Also in Brooklyn, that was also Kings County. Okay, let's go to the next case. Here's a case in Nassau County. Nassau County is Long Island. What happened here was a plaintiff was self-employed as a foot doctor. He was a podiatrist and he underwent a lumbar laminectomy procedure with the defendant doctor. So this is a medical malpractice case. And, um, and what he argued was that, let me see exactly what happened. So, and then the doctor also performed an exploratory surgery a month later to look for and repair a spinal cord injury. So the plaintiff reported injuries during the initial surgery. He found a dural tear of the spinal cord with the cerebrospinal fluid leaking to the um, known as something as a canis medullaris syndrome and dysesthesia. So that's pretty serious. Dysesthesia is like when you, it's an abnormal pain response with bilateral lower extremity numbness. So he had numbness in the low, lower extremities in the legs. So according to the plaintiff and his wife, uh, she also sued for loss of sor services or loss of consortium. The doctor, um, I mean, actually the plaintiff, I'm sorry, sustained sacral nerve damage and cauda equina syndrome leading to fecal incontinence, urinary retention, the need for self-catheters, uh, perianeal numbness, erectile dysfunction. So really serious injuries from this because it's nerve injury. And um, yeah, he basically sued many surgeons, orthopedic groups and hospitals, but then the claims only remained against this one doctor. Um, at trial. I guess the other ones got out on summary judgment. Maybe there was a settlement. It doesn't say exactly how the other ones were released from the case. But he basically said that the first procedure and the subsequent procedure were bo both performed negligently with lack of informed consent and inadequate or no post-surgical examination or monitoring. And then the plaintiffs claimed there was a delay in reoperating, allowing his condition to progress and his injuries to become more significant. And then, um, yeah, so basically, let me tell you the verdict. The verdict in this case was a compensatory pain and suffering. Uh, they, they found for the plaintiff, they found that the defendant did uh, deviate from good and accepted medical practice and that it was a cause of the injury. And they found for the plaintiff and the verdict was $5,750,000. So pretty good verdict for the plaintiff. But because the parties had agreed to a high-low, uh, it was reduced to two million. So I guess they had some kind of a high-low. I don't know what the low was. The low might've been like 500,000, but I guess the low protected the plaintiff because if they would have said, you know what, the doctor did nothing wrong, then the plaintiff would get zero. But with this high-low, he probably got something. I don't know, I'm just guessing maybe it was 500,000. It could have been less, it could have been a little bit more, but then the high was two million. So he couldn't have gotten more than, so even though he got almost six million, he has to go down to two because of the high low. So that's what a high low is. It's like an agreement you could, put, you don't have to, you could put it in place. But it sounds like this is a really serious injury. So it's kind of, um, and I recognize the defense firm as well as the plaintiff's firm, yeah, and in this case. And this was, this was actually, this was tried at the end of December of 2022 of last year. So fairly recent, but not, not super recent either. Okay, let's see the next case we have here. Here's a case from Erie County, which is up north. This is just a simple uh, case, a car crash. Basically, he said he stopped his car waiting to make a left when the vehicle behind him rear-ended him. And he had inguinal hernia, which required surgery. 
as well as post-traumatic stress and anxiety. And he argued the defendant was careless and negligent and going too fast, excessive rate of speed crashing into him. And the verdict, this was a plaintiff, by the way, was 80 years old here. And the verdict was actually a defense verdict. It doesn't say why, if it was defense on, I'm guessing it must have been a defense verdict on, on damages, maybe that they argued the hernia was not caused by the crash. Because if it's a hit in the rear like that, where he was stopped, I don't think they could have found that the defendant didn't do anything wrong. I mean, the defendant rear-ended him, he was stopped. So I'm guessing it must have been something to do with the hernia, that it wasn't caused by the crash. But this was up in Buffalo, New York, up in Erie County. That's pretty far up there. And this was in uh, also in December of 22. Okay, and the next one is a case where a woman tripped and fell on a public sidewalk. Okay. And basically, she tripped and fell on a broken, cracked, or uneven sidewalk. And this was against the city of New York. So similar to the Transit Authority case, but there they had like snow or some kind of foot trap condition on stairs where the snow crew should have cleaned it. Here, it's more of like a cracked sidewalk on the, you know, just a pedestrian sidewalk. And she argued the defendant knew or should have known about this dangerous condition, failed to fix it, and was negligent in causing and allowing the sidewalk to be in this bad, unsafe condition. And the plaintiff claimed that they had written notice. Yeah, because when you sue the city, you have to have what's known as prior written notice. It can't just be notice. In a regular slip and fall case, you could just argue notice. Hey, they knew about it. How did they know about it? Well, I verbally complained to them or somebody, my witness verbally complained to them. Maybe they caused it and created it. Or maybe the condition just existed. Hey, you know, I saw this crack uh, a few hours ago, a few hours past. Now you fall on the same uh, defective condition or crack. Now, hey, it existed. That's constructive notice. It, because we know it existed, hey, you should have found it and you should have fixed it. But with the city, they give the extra protection because it's the city of New York. So you can't just say, hey, this particular, let's say, misleveled condition where one of the sidewalk flags is way higher than another, this particular misleveled condition just existed for like, you know, a week or existed for six months. Hey, I saw it before. I even have a photo of it. That's not enough. What you have to have is prior written notice and it has to be sent to the city. So the only way, or one of the only ways to do that is to have what's known as this Big Apple map. And the Big Apple map, uh, they go out and they look at all the, the entire city and they actually have markings and that gives prior written notice to the city. So the defendant disputed the plaintiff's claim that it had prior written notice and then the broken cement was around a tree and it said that the plaintiff was at fault. So anyway, what happened in this case was and they had, by the way, experts, I think both plaintiff had, I think plaintiff and defendant had experts. I see two different experts here. It doesn't say who's who, but uh, maybe these are plaintiff's experts. They had, they had experts, you know, engineering experts. And I recognize the firm for the plaintiff and the judge. And this was in Queens, by the way. This happened also in December of 2022. But in, in, in the end, the, it was actually a defense verdict. He got zero. So I guess they felt either that there was no negligence or that the plaintiff was at fault. I don't know exactly why. It doesn't say why, but it was a defense verdict. Okay, let's go to the next case. We've done about what, like four cases now? Or let me see, one, two, three, four. <clears throat> Maybe five, I think we've done five cases. Let me see if I could do one or two more. Try to pick some interesting ones. Here's an interesting case. Okay, this is a case um, that also happened in December of 2022, also in Nassau, which is Long Island. And this is actually a lawsuit against the county of Nassau. And what happened here was a, <clears throat> a plaintiff who was a 50-year-old male, and he was employed as a court officer. So he worked for the courts as a court officer. So these are the people in the court that either you know, let people in, make sure it's safe, they go through the metal detectors, check attorney IDs. Now they could be in the courthouse too. Like if you have an exhibit and you say, hey, judge, I want to move this into evidence. You might say, show it to the court officer, give it to the court officer, and then the court officer will bring it to the judge. So they have a lot of different duties that might be assigned to a courtroom. They might be assigned to general duty in the courthouse. But so this court officer was actually one. He got injured. He got injured in the courthouse. What happened was a door, a courthouse door slammed closed on him. 
And he was just reporting to the Nassau County Court for work, just going to work like one morning. And all of a sudden this door slammed on him. And he argued that the door was broken and it was really old. And so he was entering the courthouse and the door arm mechanism caused the door to slam on his hand, pushing him into the stationary door and knocking him into the building and then to the floor. So, yeah, I guess the door was just like broken or the, the, or the, the, the elbow of the door, the, the mechanism that the door closer was broken. So he reportedly sustained um, spinal cord compression with significant neurological sequelae, as well as C3, C7 disc bulging and herniations with radiculopathy. And he needed decompressive laminectomy and fusion surgeries using titanium rod and screws with bone grafting, resulting in severe post-surgical scarring. So this is a real serious injury. And he claimed he sustained compartment syndrome, tendon damage to his right wrist, and right shoulder rotator cuff strain. And he was rendered permanently disabled and claimed quality of life and past and future wage loss. And his wife also sued for loss of consortium, loss of services. And the plaintiff argued that the defendants failed to provide a safe and secure environment for members of the public to transverse um, you know, just basically to go in and out of the building because of this uh, door mechanism was broken and that the defendant was aware of this condition and failed to remedy it. And according to the defendant, um, he needed to file a worker's compensation case because they were saying, well, he's an employee of the court. So he's an employee of, I guess, Nassau County, whoever he's suing, that's a county court. He's a county employee. It's worker's comp. He can't sue. There's no third party lawsuit. And so the plaintiffs filed a motion for summary judgment regarding liability, which was granted by the court. So I guess they must have had really good evidence because in a case like that, you know, usually that's an issue of fact. So if you can win summary judgment, it means you have a lot of evidence that this door was broken. You knew about this door, that it was like unavoidable, that, you know, it shouldn't slam on people. And it was slamming on people, almost like a race ipsa theory. I'd have, to, I'd have to read the cases. It's interesting. I might actually look at this case if it's available on the e-filing, maybe I'll, I'll read what happened. So they proceeded to, the, to trial on damages only. And like I mentioned, um, it was a trial in December of 2022 in Nassau County. Um, yeah, in Nassau County, against Nassau County, in the Nassau Courthouse, against the county. So the verdict, the verdict was actually a very large verdict. It was $20,156,772. And it was broken down as pain and suffering was 15 million, future medicals were almost a million, past wages were 600,000, future wages were 2.6 million, and compensatory other damages were 400,000. So the total compensatory allowance was 19 million point, point 0.6, and then there was another 500,000 for the loss of services, the loss of consortium, which is the damage to the marriage. And so altogether, like over $20 million, 20.156. So very, very high verdict there. Okay, let's see what other cases we have. Let's see, I'm going to pick some interesting ones. I don't want to do the run-of-the-mill ones because sometimes they're a little bit boring. But let's see what else we have here. I mean, here's a really simple case. It's just a case that happened in um, <clears throat> in New York County, actually, which was uh, Manhattan. And uh, yeah, I recognize the judge. I recognize the defense firm. I don't know the plaintiff's firm, but what happened was a 10-year-old um, minor child was, um, he was playing a game in a classroom and he injured his finger. He like bent back the finger of his left hand game of mercy and then they argued that um <clears throat> i'm not sure who they sued it says they sued jk so i don't know did they sue like another oh maybe they sued another kid hmm. Wh whoever did that i guess they're saying in failing to avoid physical contact with the plaintiff and failing to exercise self-control and appropriate behavior on school premises so they, they argued assumption of the risk and that they denied that the allegations occurred. So that's interesting. So he didn't sue the school for negligent supervision, but I think he might have sued the parents of the other 
child. Because it's saying that plaintiff LM, 10 years old, said defendant JK, a minor child of the defendants, and then they named the defendants, individuals, I guess the parents, bent back the fingers of his left hand. So anyway, what happened? So the case settled for $11,000. So 7,333,000 are to be deposited to a special account for the infant. And then when the infant becomes 18, he uh, could use that money. And then um, $3,667 went to plaintiff's counsel for their attorney's fees and costs. So a very small settlement. So we run the gamut. We get zero, we get 11,000, we get 20 million. You see, like, these are just the 10 most recent verdicts that they're listing here in, in New York. Um, this case, I'm trying to find some interesting cases to talk about. Oh, this one's kind of interesting. Okay, let's let's talk about this one. Maybe this could be the last one. So this is a case where a lawyer, a, a, a plaintiff in Brooklyn. This is actually a civil rights case. So this went into federal court into the Eastern District of New York, and it was uh, the trial was November thirtieth of twenty twenty two. So right at the uh, towards the end of last year, and plaintiff was an inmate, and he said his civil rights were violated upon his release from prison because the New York State Department of Corrections imposed enforced conditions of supervision despite the absence of any order for same. So there was no order for any supervision, but then the Corrections Department supervised him after he was released. And um, so he named a bunch of people, the parole board, and he filed for compensatory and punitive damages. And he called that false imprisonment, deprivation of civil rights, and intentional infliction of emotional distress, negligent infliction of emotional distress, negligent hiring and supervision, and respondeat superior. And he basically claimed the defendants were negligent in not vacating, but enforcing the illegal post-release supervision imposed on him. So there was no order for it, but they were still enforcing it. So he said, well, what's going on with that? And refusing to ask a judge to resentence him, which led to his reincarceration for violating the post-release supervision. And he saw damages of five million per count. And the defendants claimed the plaintiff's action was barred by the statute of limitations and argued that the plaintiff had no evidence supporting a punitive damages claim. A jury returned a verdict in favor of the plaintiff, which included 250,000 in punitive damages against each of the three defendants. So they gave him compensation for 100,000 and then the three defendants that he sued, um, I guess it was the parole board, the Department of Corrections, and maybe a commissioner. And so they gave 250 against each. So they found that it was punitive, that it was that they shouldn't have been doing it. There was, there was no authority to do it. And they gave 250, 250, and 250. So the total was $850,000. So a pretty interesting case there. And then we have you know more cases here. This is just the, the 10 most recent. But if we look, um, if we start searching, we could search by different filters. Maybe the next video, I'll do a few different types of cases. I was thinking of doing car accidents, um, commercial vehicles, uh, maybe some types of injuries like arthroscopic surgery that a lot of people have or fusion that a lot of people have herniated discs with heat fusion. Okay, I hope this has been helpful. Let us know what questions you have. Please like and subscribe to our channel and we are here for you. Okay, have a great day, everyone. Talk to you very soon.